All right, well, just out of light, I mean, you should be happy that I'm here this morning and that I didn't have to call in with a concussion and go through a concussion protocol. You know, this is my, this, this, this picture here is my drive, well, not really my driveway, it's the walk up to our house. Our house faces the north, it snows a lot. Well, it doesn't snow a lot, you guys know that. It snows sometimes like it has. And here I have my slick, nice shoes on, and I was like skiing, sledding down to my truck. <laughs> so I'm glad I didn't have to go through a, any kind of uh, concussion or anything like that. I've done that before, actually. Fall, fall in, just slip, wham, boom, right, flat. Just happened so quick. One time I had a suitcase in my hand, it came up, hit me in the face. You know, I mean, you never know. But um, so I'm thankful for that uh, this morning that I don't have to call somebody else, one of you guys, somebody else to come and fill in for me. So um, anyway, we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapter 1. So if you have your Bible, you can turn there. And, you know, I put it all up on a slide too, but we're going to read through it together. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 1, and we're going to go down through this uh, this little section here. You know, it's kind of, I mean, I'll be honest with you. When Jeff called me, this was the verse that came, and I said, yes, I would love to be able to fill in for you, and this is the verse that the, these are the verses that the Lord gave me. So here I am, I'm in these verses, but in actuality and reality, it's a little bit awkward to just jump right into this chapter. This is one of my favorite chapters. I mean, Ephesians 1 is amazing, and we're jumping in in the middle of a thought that, you know, that Paul has here. And, you know, he's just been talking about all of the riches and all of the blessings that, and all the spiritual things that we have in Jesus Christ and what he has given to us so freely. And then he's then he comes into this place that we're going to be at, this prayer that he has for the Ephesian church. And so that's where we're going to pick up. And it says there in verse 15, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, <clears throat> what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places." Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. I mean, this is just an amazing section of scripture. And, you know, I, I entitled this, um, you know, essential knowledge because Paul has three specific things. I mean, there's a lot in this passage. I get that. And there's a lot of things that we can take from it, but there's three specific things that we're going to talk about that really give us, that really give us, um, you know, uh, that Paul was wanting for us really to grab onto and for the Holy Spirit to illuminate in our hearts and our lives. And so we're going to look specifically at those three things, but we have to build up to that. And so we, we need to remember that, therefore, Paul here, he's talking about all these spiritual blessings and the heavenly places and all this up above. The Holy Spirit giving that as a gift. I mean, so much packed into those verses above. But then he's led into this place where he is remembering. Therefore, I also, after I heard of the faith, of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for the saints. You know, his memory and his thought towards this church, it made him, it, there was a reaction in him. What was going on within the church and in the body of Christ there, that, that local body of Christ in Ephesus, that town, it, it motivated him to pray. You know, there's a couple of ways that I think we can view this passage. You know what, maybe you have people in your life and maybe you've done this. I mean, I'm, I'm sure a lot of us have, have come to this passage of scripture and we say, we say, wow, it just reminds us of somebody. And we just start to pray. We need to do that. We need to use that passage in this way that we would have the body of Christ on our hearts and that we would be praying one for another. And we're going to see that here in a deeper way in a minute. 
That's one way that this passage can be applied to our lives. But the other way that this passage can actually be applied to our lives is in our own life, that we would have this prayer for us, for our heart, that these would be things that were reflected in our life and through our life. And so there's a couple of ways that we can apply this passage and these three things and all of this that God has given to us. But the first thing is that we want to talk about, they had faith in the Lord. You know, that faith had developed in them. They had heard the word of God and it had developed in them a real trust. You know, faith has two aspects to it. There's a mental assent to a truth, right? There's a mental assent about it. But then comes the relying or the action that we rely upon that truth. Not just that we believe something or that we trust something or, you know, that we have this mental idea of what it is, but there is the second part of faith that really brings it home in our lives and brings it to an active place. And it is that we rely upon that truth that we know or that we believe. And so faith is something that is active in our lives. We can believe something and not have faith. We can, we can know something. I mean, I mean, you know, Paul later on, the Bible says there that, um, you know, even the de- demons believe and they tremble. They know, they've seen God. They believe, they have belief. They have intellectual, I guess, intellectual, <laughs> I don't know. They have intellectual thoughts about, they, they know the reality of who God is. They know that. But yet their faith doesn't follow. It's not faith because they don't put it into action in their life. And so faith has that. So, so Paul sees here that they have faith, not just belief in God. And I, I think that's really a good application for us. Do we just, you know, do we, we just have knowledge? Do we just hear things? Or are we putting it into action, relying upon it in our lives? And that's the difference there just between, you know, trust or belief and actual faith. So he saw that in them, it motivates him to pray, but he also saw this, this other part and aspect of the body of Christ, that, that they had love for all the saints. You know what, it's amazing how, um, how many times in the Bible that we see that we are to love one another as the body of Christ. We are to love each other. We are to have a love for one another. Here's one of those, and it's in um, Luke 10, 27. And this is an interesting one because because Jesus affirms what this lawyer says. There, There was a guy there that was a lawyer. He knew the law. He knew the commandments of God. He wasn't really a believer, you know, or a Christian. It was, I mean, that's Old Testament, right? You know, when Jesus was teaching, when he was on the earth, that was still Old Testament ideas, Old Testament thoughts. But this guy, he knew, he knew the law of God. And look at what Jesus says and and ask him that question. What's the most important command or what, what are the commandments? And he funnels it down into this very succinct statement. He says, so he answered, the lawyer did, answered Jesus and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind mind and your neighbor as yourself. Now, I, I, you know, we've all known that, right, as the golden rule. I mean, from a little kid, I was taught that in church, that I am to love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, you know, strength. I'm to love the Lord my God, but I'm also, right next to that, I'm to love my neighbor as myself. You can't really take those two and break them apart. They need to go together. And so in scripture, we see that we are to love the Lord our God, for sure. All through scripture, we're to see that, to be set apart, to be sanctified and be wholly devoted to him. But also that what goes along with that, and 1 John makes it really clear that we are, we can't even say that we love God if we don't love our brothers and sisters. We can't even make the claim that we love God if we don't love our brothers and sisters. So it's super important that we, we, don't, we can't break them apart. They can't be broken apart. When we love God, automatically it's going to make us love the people that are in the body of Christ. And we need to be doing that. And so Paul, he's reminded of that. Here's another one So uh, where Paul writes this in uh, Romans 12, 5. He says, so being... So we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. 
<laughs> when we love one another, we're loving, essentially we're loving ourselves because we're part of the body of Christ. We're part of that collective nature that God has brought us together by the cross of Jesus Christ. Here's another one. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. That's in Ephesians 4.25. We are members of one another. We belong to one another. We're attached to one another. Now, this idea isn't just this body and this local body. And I'm really thankful for all of you guys, you know, and how there's connections there. There's, there's, there, there are, there, there is a love and there's a reaction and an action that we have together as the body of Christ here. But you know what? That transcends out of these walls and into the universal corporate body of Christ all through this valley, all through this world where people are meeting on this day to praise the Lord. We are connected as members of one body. That's amazing. It reminds me of, it reminds me, have you guys ever uh, driven up, if you go past Paonia and you go up there, I can't remember what that road's called, but it turns to a dirt road at one point. Lost Lake is up there and all. They say that that Aspen Grove, have you been up there through that place? If you haven't, you should go up there and maybe camp or whatever. But there's huge Aspen trees, big ones, really big ones all over there. Do you know that those aspen trees are one of the biggest, maybe, and some people have made the claim that that grove of aspens is the biggest organism on earth because they're all connected. All those, that's how aspens grow. Have you ever seen an aspen seed? Has anybody ever talked about an aspen seed? No, they, they grow with rhizomes. They throw roots up. They throw another baby little plant that comes up. They're all connected. Amazing. That's like the body of Christ. We're connected. We may not know, we may be a long ways away from each other, but we're connected and we need to remember. See, Paul is remembering that about this body. They were doing that. They were connected together. They were loving one another. In other places in the New Testament, we see that the the early church was giving to the part that had need. Back to Jerusalem. They were sending money back to Jerusalem because they were in need. They were loving one another, not just by word, but with deed and the things that they did. Here's another one that's really good for us that Jesus said there in John, um, it, it tells us there in John 13, and this is at Passover when Jesus is talking to his disciples, this intimate time. He says, and a new covenant I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. It's our testimony. Our testimony should be love. That love that we have for the Lord should be working out really practically in our love for one another. Paul is reminding us of that. Here's another, you know, Jeff, I I don't know if it was last week. It might've been last week. It might've been the week before. He mentioned all the one another's in scripture, the times that it says one another, and it's dealing with the church. It's dealing with you and I, the body of Christ, all of these references. There's over 60 times, 30 individual things ideas, 30 individual ones, and you can see those. Those are all populated. You can't read them. They're too small. I couldn't get it all on there if I did that. Um, but, um, but, there, but there are 30 individual ones, specific ways that we love one another and that the, and that the Word of God tells us and teaches us how we love, how that love is borne out in the different, different things that we we do as the body. And really that, that, the, the one that is overarching all of that is to love one another. Just that basic, just to have that love for one another. Uh, it's, uh, you know, there's 13 times that it's just that basic, have love for one another. You know, and so Paul, that was a big thing to Paul, and he was seeing that reflected in the Ephesian church. It was thriving um, in a lot of ways. And he says that in Revelation, that they had a lot of good things going. And in Revelation, he talks, talks about how they had lost their first love um, of Jesus, and he encourages them to get back to that. But, you know, it was a dynamic church. They were loving one another. And so that really motivated that, that idea of him seeing that in the church, it motivated him to um, ask for these things, that God would do these things in that church. So, so he continues on and he says, do not, <clears throat> he does not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ of glory may give to you. I want you to just, I want to stop just for a second and talk about that idea there to give to you. Here we see that he was motivated to pray, but he was praying that God would give to 
these people. Now, (laughs) that word give there is really important for us to look at and think about. That word there, the basic idea behind that word is to give with no strings attached. That's the kind of giving this word Ta- this this word give talks about. That's, that's, that's what it is. It's like with no strings attached that there is a giving. So Paul is saying, I want God to give you this, but it's a free, it's a gift. It's totally free. There's nothing attached to it. There's nothing that you do. It's God, God just give, just dump this out on these people. You know, there is another, there is another word that has with it the idea that you give out of obligation. Not, not out of a bad sense of obligation, but if somebody works for you, then you give them a wage, right? Because they worked. They worked for it. And this is important because Paul is saying, uh, this isn't based, his prayer is not based on works. If they would do this or that or that. No, he just wants God to pour out on them these things. Just to pour out on them these things freely, no strings attached. And uh, you know what? That blesses my heart because I can easily get tied up in a works-based idea that if I do such and such and I have my little formula there, you know, I mean, do you guys have your formulas? (laughs) Sometimes my morning routine becomes my little formula for the day, right? It's not a bad thing, but when we just reduce it to a formula in our relationship with the Lord, just to a formula, if I do these things, it's just work. And it doesn't reflect the the idea of God's free gift. His free gift of giving and pouring out lavishly upon his people. That's what he does. He's a giver. He is a giver. We can never outgive. So it's really important that we understand that this is giving with no strings attached. You know, if you're under the condemnation of works, if you're under, if you're thinking, well, I mean, God, I don't think God can really love me today because of this or that or the things that I thought or the things that I did. You know what? The awesome thing about God is we can turn around, we can turn that around and we can come one second, be one place and another second in, the, in our hearts We can be in a whole other state with the Lord. I just love that about my Christian life. I love that about what the Lord does because he knows and he sees. He knew way before time ever began, before I ever took one breath, who I was going to be, what I was going to do. He's not surprised by any of it. And yet he pours out continually. I heard an analogy of somebody you know, when we stand in the light of God and when we stand with him in that light of God, he just, he just showers that light around us, you know? And so I, I just, I just um, you know, I just want to encourage you in that, you know? Uh, don't, don't get on the works treadmill, you know, the little mice, mouse running around trying to get exercise. You know, that's not what we need to be doing. We need to be just loving and believing and walking in the, the blessing that the Lord gives. Um, so, uh, so he wants us to be given the spirit of wisdom, the revelation of the knowledge of him, and that the eyes of our understanding being enlightened that you may know. Okay. So, so the mechanism here of these three things, and we still haven't gotten to the three things, but this is really important for us to look at because we need this. This is, this is the foundation of all of this. This is that they were walking. They were, they were loving one another. They were by faith believing in God's promises. And he sees that. And so he prays these things. And, he, it, and what he's praying is for wisdom to understand three, three things. And he describes that wisdom. He describes that knowledge. He describes that understanding that we have. And so we need to stop and we need to think about that. How in the world is this going to happen in our lives? How does this happen in the lives of the people that you love and that you care about? How will this happen? How will these three three things become, you know, important enough for people to change, to walk in, to be, you know, encouraged or changed into this way of walking? You know, there is. We need this. We need this to happen. We need a spirit of wisdom. We need revelation of who Jesus is. And we need the eyes of our understanding. Some translations say the eyes of their hearts. Be opened up 
to these truths in a deeper way that he's going to share with us in a minute. Um, you know, this is, this is how we have revelation. This is how our eyes are open. This is how we have knowledge. This is how our understanding of who God is grows. And it's these two things. And we talk about this a lot. You know, here I understand that. I under, we do. We need the Spirit of God. We need the Spirit of God and we need the Word of God. Those two things combined... They do. They give us revelation. They give us knowledge. They give us understanding. Those two things combined bring life to our knowledge and to what we know about God. So, um, you know, when we, this is one of my favorite passages, that whole scripture there, um, John chapter 17 or John chapter 14, when Jesus, when the disciples are actually really getting that Jesus is going to die and he's going to leave them, he's going to be gone what was the comforting thought that he gave to the disciples? It was that he was going to send the helper, the Holy Spirit, this very thing. The, and, and scattered throughout, you know, John uh, 14, 15, and 16 are little bits and pieces of the work and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in your life and in my life. And that, 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 that gets me really excited. That's a whole study in and of itself. But look at what he says here. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. We need that, right? We need that. We need the ministry and the working of the Holy Spirit to bring to our remembrance the things that God has said, the things that he has said in his word, the things he has communicated through us through the experience of our life and how that relates to his word. You know, the spirit of God, you know, the spirit of God is essential in us being able to understand the word of God. Have you ever had, you know, I don't know, in your life, I don't, I don't know how much you've read the word or how, what a, commitment you've had to that. I pray that after today, you'll have more and more of a commitment. I hope that I will as well, you know, because I don't think that we can have enough. You know, you can't, you can't make a foundation too solid for a house. (laughs) I mean, I mean, how can you do that? How, How would you, I mean, you know, we want it to be, we want solidness, you know, so we need that, the foundation of the word of God. You, you, you can't overdo the word of God. You, you may, maybe you've read over a certain passage, you know, a lot of times. Maybe it's your life verse. Maybe it's some verse that you've, you've had in your, have you ever had that where that verse just comes to life in a new way? Depending on the circumstances, depending on where you're at, depending on the people that you're dealing with, depending on the trial, the tribulation that you've gone through, and all of a sudden there's this whole new direction that God gives you. That's revelation. That's what God does. That's what Paul's praying for here. That the spirit of God would take the word of God and reveal it in a deeper way, who Jesus is and what he can do. And so, you know, we need that. The word of God becomes a foundation. So I don't know if you made a new year's resolution to read the word one more, one (laughs) more than you ever have. You know what? This is just a this is just a reminder that there are things out there that really make it really easy. I have, I just bought a new one of these because I've done this for many years. After Bible college, I just really committed that I was going to try to read through the word all, all that I can. And this really makes it really convenient and really easy because it's broken up by date. And all I have to do is open that up to the date and I just read through it. So anyway, I thought that I would uh, just give you this. I bought mine on Amazon. There, It's all over. Somebody told me that you can buy it from Bible bookstores too and and all and however the lord leads you in that you need to do that um i just did it because it's easy this is the qr code for it if you held your phone up to it you could buy it right now on amazon or wherever so i'm just encouraged i mean this is actionable right i mean let's do it let's not just you know say it if you've been saying it get something like this you know because it makes it easy and it takes out the well i don't know i can't do it blah, blah, blah. it's all there i gotta flip through the i don't have time you know No, grab your coffee, grab your, and then the other thing that I was thinking about this that really kind of got me excited was, what if it was that all of us were doing that? What if we were all reading in the same spot? And you know, you in your women's study, you know, you come and you you know that they've been reading too, and you're like, dang, did you, did you, did you read that part this morning? That was awesome. You know, and there's fellowship automatically there. It's built in. You know, I mean, wouldn't that be cool if we were all reading in the same spot? Anyway, um, 
I don't know. I think that's cool. For the first time in my marriage, I'm doing that with Brenda. We bought the same one. We've been doing it off and on, but we, were, we bought the same one. So um, hopefully that'll happen. So anyway, but this is, okay, this is the deal here. This is where uh, I think the excitement of all of this happens because, and, and where really the rubber meets the road in our life. The spirit of God takes the object, the object, <laughs> the objective nature of the word of God and translates it or gives revelation in subjective aspects of our life. See, see, this is the life. This is the life that we need. This is, Paul is praying for this, that the Holy Spirit would take the, object, the objective nature of his word and bring it in, into the subjective areas of our life. And what I mean by that is, I mean, we have all kinds of things. We have all kinds of circumstances, all kinds of trials in our life. How do you apply the literal, you know, objective word of God? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. <laughs> I mean, right? That's an objective statement. I mean, you, you, yeah, but how do you do that? How do I do that? How do I do that at work? How do I do that with my family? How do I do that? See, the word of, word of God the, and the spirit of God takes the word of God and he makes that alive in our hearts. So it's not just, uh, you, know, <laughs> you know, that I'm to love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind. And it's this uh, thing that I say. Or the Lord's Prayer, you know, that it just becomes a mantra that we do. No, <laughs> you know, we need the revelation of the Lord to bring that into reality in the daily subjective nature of our life. I mean, you know, I, I, I mean, a good example of that is there was somebody, I, I flashed up there that Amazon page. I buy things on Amazon. I do. And somebody brought up uh, you know, this and said, well, you can get that on Bible.org or whatever. I don't know. You can buy that same one. Well, I, you can. And that's, that's awesome. That's really good. Um, oftentimes I'm in a place where I just want to buy something. And, and so I push that button and Amazon is convenient. I know that. But you know what? They were, they were saying their conviction. They were saying their, and I have no problem with that. I have no problem with that. That's the subjective nature. And to them, they are, the Holy Spirit is revealed to them. They don't want to buy anything off of Amazon. You know, that's fine. I'm not going to argue it. But that's one of those areas. That's a sub subjective place, right? Should you buy off of Amazon? Should you post that on Facebook? Right? Lots of subjective things in our lives, but God wants us to be applying his word in every facet of our life. How do we do that? It's through the spirit of God giving us revelation of who Jesus is. And then it becomes real to us. We need that revelation. Paul is praying that for the church. Um, that you may know. Now, these are the three things. We're going to go into the three things that Paul is really specifically praying here. We've got to have the revelation. We've got to have the knowledge. We've, we need understanding of these things, a deeper understanding of these three things. So here is the first one that he talks about, that we would know the hope of his calling that we would know the hope of his calling. When we see that idea of hope, I mean, uh, I mean, immediately my mind jumps to, well, I don't know. What does your mind jump to? What's our hope as believers? There's a basic hope, right? Heaven, right? That's where my mind automatically jumps to. That I have eternal life and it is based upon the cross of Jesus Christ that he gave his life for me and that I am, you know, his child. I'm saved and that I have a future with him in glory, in heaven, for eternity, everlasting life, water never runs dry, all of that. You know, that's, I mean, awesome. That is an awesome hope that we have. Um, but we, and the reason that we need that hope is because of this. Jesus said there in, in John chapter 16, 33, in the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I mean, laced in that is that idea of tribulation. That's why we need hope because we're going through the things of this world. We're going through difficulties. We're going through trials. Some of it we've brought on ourselves. Some of it the world brings on us. Some of us, some of it is the enemy. You know, there, there's all kinds of ways that we go through tribulation in our lives. And, but laced in this is that hope. But be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. There's hope there because Jesus has overcome the world. So that basic hope that we have, and how about this? Looking for that blessed hope in Titus, looking 
looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I mean, this is really it, right? The blessed hope that we have and the promise. See, that's where, the, that's where, the, that's where hope really gets traction. It's in the promises of God. And then we go right back to the word of God. It's full of God's promises. We can take those promises by the power of the Holy Spirit. He brings those to life and we walk out the promises of God in our lives, in our families, in our relationships, and wherever the Lord takes us. So, um, so we need that. But I want to stop for a second and, 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 and think, how does that really tie to the calling that we have? I mean, basically, we are called to be his daughters, his sons. We are called. And we're, that's part of that basic calling. We will, as his daughters and sons, we will be with him in heaven Great hope there. But what about the calling that he's put upon our lives? How does that relate? Where's the hope in that? The hope of his calling? That, what about that part of his calling? You know, I, it's really easy for us to just skip over. Well, yeah, my hope is, my hope is heaven. My hope is when I see the Lord. My hope is when I get out of this body, you know, or whatever, however we see that. But what about now? What about hope for today, for tomorrow? You know, if the Lord doesn't come back, we're living in this because we're living in a calling that the Lord has given to each one of us. If we're part of the body of Christ, he's called us. There's something that he has given us to do and to live out in this world. And so, you know, that calling that he has given, that calling that he has given to you through the gifting that maybe he has given, the spiritual gifting that he's given to you, do you know what your spiritual gift is? Do you know how spiritually God tends to work in your life and through your life? I'm not saying that we just all have one or two or three. No, I, I think that he can gift us in a lot of different ways. But you know, when we talk about calling, you can't really break too far away from the idea of the spiritual gifting that God gives. I mean, look at it later on in Ephesians chapter four, he talks about the gifts that are given to the body, right? Leadership gifts that the body needs in order to become you know, pure, or pure uh, you know, complete and full, mature in, in, in God's, uh, you know, kingdom and in his work that he does in the will that he wants to accomplish here on the earth. And so I think that we can take, for example, the calling of Paul, and we can see the hope that he had in both that basic calling of heaven, but also in the calling that he had. Look at what it says here. This is uh, God talking to Ananias. And so we get a little snapshot of God calling Ananias or Paul through Ananias. And, and this is the Lord says to Ananias, go for he, Saul, is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. Right there, we see a calling that God has called Paul to. I mean, that's a big calling, that he's going to bear the name of Jesus before Gentiles, kings, and the children of God. And we have, you know, the book of Acts, and we can read through that, and we can see how that actually played out. All of the things that played out in Paul's life, or a lot of the things that played out in Paul's life. That, that was his calling. But look at what it says. It kind of wraps into what we're talking here about hope that for I will show him many things he must suffer for my name's sake. See, 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 there's the tribulation. There's the difficulty. There's the trial. And we can read through chapters where Paul talks about the things, shipwrecks, all of these things, persecutions, he was stoned, all of these things that he went through. But if you go back and you see, but here's the hope. He's a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name, to bear my reputation. He's going to have that. He's going to bear that out to the world in all of these different ways. There's hope laced in that. There's purpose in that. There's partnering with the Lord in his purpose and his will for the world today through you and through me. I know I'm not Paul, I know I'm not Paul. <laughs> and I know that uh, I, don't, I don't do the thing. I don't have the gift. I mean, he was an apostle. He had that gifting. He, he was very much an apostle type ministry where he was going around. He was planting churches. I think in my book, sorry, Emily, but I'm going to say this. I think Emily is a, an apostle. 
He is a modern day apostle. He's discipling people. He's building churches. He's leading pastors of those churches. You know, that's, that's what Paul did. I mean, it's almost a reflection of what Paul did. In, it, we have it right here in our body, an example of that. Somebody living out the calling. You know, I've asked Emily, so do you think you're a pastor? And he looks at me and goes, no, I'm not a pastor. Do you want to teach? No, I'm not a pastor. But he teaches. <laughs> You know, it looks different in all of our lives, but there's a calling and there's a hope in that calling for today. What is your gifting? Are you walking in that gifting? Are you walking in the calling that God has for you? Because Paul wants us to understand the hope that is in his calling of you. He wants you to understand that there's hope in that. Not just jumping forward to the hope of heaven, but seeing the hope that is in the things that he has called you and I to do right now in this life. See, we see that Paul struggles with these two hopes. He struggles with these two things. For me to live, in Philippians 1, 22, we see, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live on in this flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two. The two hopes that are there. He was grounded to the calling that God had given to him. He was walking it out. And there was a hope that was in it. There were people, and and it's just not words that I'm saying. There were people tied to that. And we see that here in a second. There were people, there were lives, there were situations, there were circumstances, specifically, individually tied to what he is saying there. There is a hope there in that. He wanted to remain in the flesh for it's needful for you. It's needful for you. But he's. But he also says, right, <laughs> that having the desire to depart and to be with Christ, I mean, that, that, that's way better. You know, he goes on to say that, that it was way better. You know, but he was hard pressed for that because there's hope in that. There's hope when we partner with the Lord. I mean, are you struggling with hope today? Just looking, you know, just look into that day when you go to be with the Lord. No. How about pulling that back? And how can I bless? How can I work? How can I bless my family? How can I bless my coworkers? How can I work in this situation? What about this person? What about that person? Can I, you know, maybe you're not really great at evangelism. There is a gifting of evangelism. There are people. Have you known that? That that's all they think about. That's all they want to do. That's all they can do. I mean, they just do it. It just comes out of who they are because it's a supernatural gifting. Now we all should be an evangelist. And in some ways we all are because we're bearing the name of Christ wherever we go. So we're all evangelists in some way. But there are those that have a specific evangelistic, you know, gifting. I mean, we need to be, do you know who has the evangelistic gifting in, in this body? Do you know who has the gift of giving? Maybe one of the things I heard a pastor say this, or I heard, he said, maybe some of the things that we should be saying in the church is, hi, I'm Aaron. I've never met you before. What's your gifting? (laughs) I mean, really? We don't know. Do you know what your gifting is? How does God want to use you? How is he using you? He gave it to you. We don't want to be like the servant that just buries what God gives us in the ground. We want to use those things for the Lord. So I just encourage you in that. What is your gifting? It's okay to talk about that because it's not us. <laughs> I know that. And that's one of the ways that you can know that it's a spiritual gifting is it's not you. You know what? Actually being up here in front of you is not me. I would rather be up in a cabin, up on the mountain, up in the maze, watching birds and deer and elk. I don't care. It's snowing up there. That's fine. I got my fire. I'm good. Seriously, I am dead serious. I I did not take any speech classes in college. I didn't want that. I didn't want to be in front of people. I hated it. Always hated it. I think that, I can't talk about it. Anyway, (laughs) I think that there is something behind all that. But, you know, I'm also not a psychologist, so. And the Lord, here I am. So (laughs) the Lord is good. And, and, And he changes us. And that's the deal. You know, a spiritual gifting is a spiritual gifting. It's something that you are not. Now, it may be that it lines up with your personality and what you're good at. Maybe maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But just because you're good at something doesn't necessarily mean that it's a spiritual gifting. Spiritual gifting is much more than that because I can't claim I can't claim glory from it. I can't claim you know any goodness from it. 
I just do it. And a lot of times I, I do it because I know that it is something that the Lord has given and I don't want to just squander what God has given. And we need to have more of that kind of an attitude and idea. I've got one other passage that I want to read here and, and then that'll finish this idea up of the hope of his calling. But look at this. <clears throat> and this is a longer passage, so I didn't put it in there on the slides. But if you have your Bible, you can turn. Therefore, having... Um, been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into his grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, so we have all of that, we have all that God has given us, and we have the grace, and by faith we enter into that, the justification that God has given to us, that, we're sin, that we have been forgiven, and that we're cleansed from our sin. But not only those things that are really spiritual, but we also glory in tribulation. And that's what we're talking about. Hope is really important for us because we're going through these tribulations. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character produces hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. You know what? You know, we are so blessed by what the Holy Spirit does in our life. He gives that hope. It's, it's poured out by knowing that the Lord loves us, that he has given to us purpose, that he has given to us the ability to, to work and to live in this world and to go rise above, you know? that he is over all things and he has everything under control. The number two uh, concept that Paul really wants us to go deeper in to have revelation about is <clears throat> what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And this, I mean, this is amazing. Jeff referenced this. You know, we are the inheritance. I mean, flat out, we are the inheritance of God. We are the inheritance. I mean, when Jeff was teaching through Matthew, came to the pearl of great price, you know, and he, he talked about how, you know, a lot of times people want to say that the pearl is Jesus and all of that. Well, no, the par parable bears out that we are actually the pearl of great price, that the man is Jesus, and he gave everything that he had for the field, for the world, and for that pearl, for that thing of great price. And that's you. That's me. It's really hard for us to see that. You know, I don't know about you guys, but I stumble on that a lot. Because I know the depth of who I am. I know the, the, the ideas and the thoughts that are in my heart. I know my failures. But you know what? This is what God sees. He sees us as his inheritance. He loves us. There's so many scriptures that talk about that, that he knew us. He knew before we ever said or did anything. He knew what we were going to do. He's not surprised by any of it. And yet he loves us just the same. We are his inheritance. We are his. Bought with the price of Jesus Christ and we are his inheritance. <clears throat> but I want to kind of back up a little bit in that idea, knowing that we are his inheritance. What about the glory, the riches of the glory of his inheritance? That idea of glory is kind of interesting. If you look it up in a Bible dictionary, you look up that word doxa, which is glory. The first, the first, you know, <laughs> Uh, definition on the surface is reputation. That's the first, that's the first. And then it goes down from there and there's all kinds of things and you end up at a place of appearance, brightness. And sometimes we hear that taught a lot that when, when it talks about the glory of who God is, that it is, <clears throat> you know, his brightness, his brilliance. We see that in the book of Revelation, that the lamb is the light of heaven and the new heaven. Uh, he lights up. There's no need for a sun or stars or anything like that because he lights it up because he is the glory. He's the brightness of God. Hebrews 1 talks about that as well. But the other and the more common use of that word is reputation. The riches of the reputation of his inheritance in the saints. It's, it's about his reputation that we are bearing his name. Look at, look at what Jesus said, because he was concerned about this. He was concerned about the glory that was coming off of his life, the reputation of God in what he was doing as he lived his life. It says here in John 17, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you. 
As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. See, see, Jesus was really concerned about that glory and that glory glorifying the Father. The glory of the action of what Jesus did, there was. There's a reputation there. There's a reputation of what Jesus did. It's amazing. It, for us, we just sang about it, you know? that There's, there's not a love that's even close to what Jesus did. That's a reputation. Um, you know what? I was thinking about this idea of reputation and I was thinking about the idea of brightness and glory. You know, the stars, they have brightness, right? And we, we see the sh light that's shining, but you don't really see the star, right? You just see the light that comes from that star. And we're told, you know, we're told by scientists that some of those stars might not even be out there anymore. But their light is, for millions of years, has been, that's, that's what they say, has been, you know, coming to us and we finally see that light. I mean, think about that in the idea of, you know, reputation. You know, people know something about us sometimes before they ever even see us by the things that we do, the things that we say, where we go, all of those things. It's important. We're bearing the name of Christ. We're bearing his reputation. It's glory. The riches of his glory are when we are bearing the name of Christ in a way that reflects his nature, his image, and his love. And we need to be doing that. That is, that, that is rich. And that is what God is. And look at what Jesus said in John 17 and in verse 5. Uh, actually, um, uh, glorified together with you. This is the one I wanted. But Jesus ends that thought of glory and the glory that he had. And he says in verse 22, he says, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be just one, just as we are one. I mean, that's an amazing thought. Jesus is praying that, that the glory that the father gave to him would actually be given to us. You know, and it's not, so the inheritance, yes, we are the inheritance of God. And throughout eternity, we are going to be, you know, displaying that glory of God through the testimony of God and what he did in our lives. And we need to know that in a deeper way. Look at what this verse says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It says, For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our mortal flesh. I mean, that's amazing. The glory of God being manifest, the reputation of God being manifest, manifest or revealed. That same word manifest is where we get revelation. The word revelation, apocalypto, revealing, the revealing. Your mortal flesh, this life, this place that God has called you into can be a revealer, a revelation of the nature of the life of Christ, of life of Jesus. And that is amazing. And that's where the riches of the glory of his inheritance are at. It's that reflection that we reflect back. It's that reputation of God. So many times we see the servants of the Lord concerned about the reputation of God through their life. And um, so Paul wants us to know deeper that our lives are a reflection, that our lives reveal that there is glory that is coming off of the lives that we live. That's an amazing, profound thought. The third thing that we are to know and that he prays that we should have revelation of is what? What is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe? Exceeding greatness of his power, that is an amazing statement there. That, is, that, that word exceeding is beyond, beyond. It's just beyond the mark. It's beyond whatever. So the word greatness there is magnificence. So what is that? I, I have no idea. What is super, super abundant? What is beyond magnificent? I mean, can you even, can, can we even categorize this? This is how Paul is saying this. This is beyond magnificent. This is beyond it's beyond that. We need revelation from God, from the Holy Spirit, from the Word of God. We need it to become real in our hearts, the power of God. One of the great um, examples of the power of God, because this word here, power, is dunamos, the dunamos power of God, which is where we get the word dynamite. And Jeff has talked about this before, and I love the analogy. If you take dynamite, and you light that dynamite, and you throw it into your bathroom or your kitchen, <laughs> what do you think? Is that place going to be the same? No, it's not. Man, it's like, it's not the same at all. It's completely and totally rearranged. 
See, that's dunamos. That's the power of God. That when we have the power of God and walk in that, and that's exactly what Jesus said that he would give to us is the power to be his witnesses in Acts 1.8, that we would be witnesses for him. When we walk into the office, when we walk into our house, when we walk, wow, is the Holy Spirit able to work and move? It's that subjective area of our life. Is he bringing to life those things? Is he bringing that up in your heart? You know, how he has the power to change? You know, when you walk into the room, is there that change? There can be, there should be, as the gospel is in your life and as the Holy Spirit is working in your life. So that power is according to the working of his mighty power. This is how he qualifies it, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly father. So the example of that power and how great that power is, is something that we can never, I mean, we can't conquer death. Uh, nobody has been able to do it to this point. I mean, we try, right? I mean, the whole, the whole thing that we're going through with the vaccine, well, we can control this. We can do this. We can get this going. You know, we can control all of these things. No, we're saying no, no, we can control people. <laughs> you know, and we can get, but we can't control the things that God puts in motion. We can't, there are things that are out of control that we have no ability to control. God does, and death is one of those. We have no, we, we, we can't control that. We don't control that. God has that in his hands. And so, uh, so the power that God demonstrates here is that he raised Jesus from the dead. He defeated death. And that is part of that hope that we have, that we, when we die, we're going to be raised up. And, uh, and, and just like that, we're reflected in this verse too. And later on in Romans chapter, um, you know, or actually in Ephesians chapter two, it talks about that, that we're raised up and seated with him because that's what God's power did. It raised him up and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality, power, might, dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. That power is working in us and, uh, you know, it's a part of the, the, the foundation of the church and his movement in the world, the vehicle of his church that's moving in the world today. Why did Paul want us to have a revelation of these three things? Um, I don't have time to go through all those other verses. There's so much there. But this is what I want. I hope that you can get from, from this time that we have together. There's a real, and, and maybe you'll pray these three things for the people around you or for your own life. <clears throat> This is why I think it's so important. Do not be deceived. You know what? This, 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 the, this passage was written to the Galatians. There were things going on in the, in the Galatians church that was pulling people into different areas, different thought process, different theology, different things that weren't, you know, part of the, do and, and really it was about, um, you know, the works of the law. And that really where, where Galatians really focuses. But this is what he said. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. And I want, this is why Paul wants us to have revelation, okay? Because God is not mocked. He is not mocked. This world, if you look out at this world, I mean, Satan's a mocker, isn't he? He's a total mocker. That's all he does. Every time he shows up in scripture, he's a mocker. He mocked God at the garden, in the garden, at the tree of life. He mocked God. He, he, God's holding back from you. You know, why do you believe him? Mocking God's word. That's what he does. That's what he always does. Jesus said he's a liar, and that's what he does. He lies. He's a mocker. When Jesus was tempted, you know what? And he went out into the desert. Satan mocked him, mocked God, mocking him. And Jesus, what did he do? He used the word of God to defeat the mocking lies of the enemy. Everywhere we see where the enemy shows up, he mocks God. Number two, we live in a world that is a mocker. It's all over. <laughs> we get frustrated because of the things in the media or the TV, whatever, whatever we're listening to. You know, we get frustrated, but really in the bottom line, it's a mocker. It's a mocker of God. The whole system that man has set up, the system that man trusts in, it mocks God. And it's done it from the beginning. The system, the Tower of Babel, God came down and he said, yeah, you can do whatever you want. You're, you're doing all these things, but <laughs> they were mocking God by what they did. You know what? The world is a mocker. But I think what really hits my heart in a bigger way is that I can reflect 
that mocking nature in my own heart. My, my, my flesh is a mocker. Have you ever been in that place where God is calling you or saying to do something, you feel the moving of the Holy Spirit and all of a sudden common sense jumps in? That's the mocker saying, no, God can't do that. God isn't going to do that. You're not going to supply that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to get good enough. I don't have the words to say. I don't know what to do. That's the mocker. We, you know what Paul is saying? You need the revelation of God's word. You need the revelation of the spirit of God because the enemy's a mocker, the world's a mocker, and the flesh is a mocker. Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived by these things. For whatever a man sows, that he will reap. And we think of that in the negative, you know, and I don't want you to go away from here thinking, oh my gosh, I did all these things. I'm going to reap all this stuff. No, but we always do. It's, it's, it, that's the mocker. That's the mocker because the other side is that, okay, right? Let's read it. For he who sows to his flesh is going to reap. That's where the mocker goes. You're just going to reap corruption. You made that bad decision back then. You're going to, how could God ever love you? That's the mocker. That is the mocker. That is not God's word because look at the flip side of that. It says, but he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. Now this is the revelation that the Holy Spirit wants to give us is that side of it. So to the spirit. How can you sow to the Spirit in your family, in your workplace, in your school, wherever you're at? How can you sow to the Spirit? How can that become more and more of your life? How in those subjective areas of your life can you walk in the power of the Holy Spirit? How can you throw a stick of dynamite into that situation and see God blow it up? You know, that's, that's the reality. That's what Paul's saying. You need revelation in these areas so that you will walk this out. That it's just not words on a page, but that it becomes the actual you know, what you do, how you live, who you are becomes a reputation that you have. And so we see that, you know, God, he, he wanted us to have that reputation. And then I just want to read this last part of Galatians 6, 10. And it says, therefore, as we have the opportunity, let us do good to all especially to those who are in the household of faith. Let us do good at all. Let the Lord, let God move in all areas, all spheres, all people that we come in contact with, but, but especially first full circle back to the body of Christ, right? That we are especially to love those who are in the body of Christ. I mean, how many times have you been talking to maybe a Christian that, you know, that you see here and there, maybe they don't fellowship here, maybe they do. And all of a sudden you're talking about something that's going on in the world and there's just division. Boom. We need, as the body of Christ, we need God's revelation of how to give the truth in love. How to talk about the truth, but do it in a way that loves and doesn't divide. Because God wants us to be loving one another. First and foremost, above everything else. God's going to work all that stuff. We need to trust the Holy Spirit working in the lives of, I need to trust the Holy Spirit working in your life. You need to trust the Holy Spirit working in my life. We need to trust the Holy Spirit working in his body down the road in another town. We need to trust that the Holy Spirit is working and we need to pray for the body of Christ. We need to love the body of Christ. 